Anna, I'm going to ask you first to uh, respond. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to focus on one of Steve's points about education. Um, he, he made the statement that education has failed, not in general terms, I'm sure, but in terms of um, improving social mobility. Um, and there's also no doubt that education has been seen as the great enabler, the potential route to social mobility. And I think it's probably worth pointing out that for, for many, particularly women in recent generations, that has actually proved to be the case. I think it's also worth pointing out that education does actually remain an important route to high wages and high status jobs. And by that I mean when you look at the people with high incomes and high status jobs, they have this elite education that Steve was talking about, because, but it doesn't mean in any way, shape or form that that has actually improved social mobility, but it does mean that we have to recognise that education is a pathway that currently people are using to get to these high status jobs. We can't ignore it. And the problem, of course, that we have is that access to higher education, and particularly elite higher education, is very socially divided. Uh, your chances of accessing an elite Russell Group institution are indeed <laughs> dramatically different depending on your social and economic background. We've been documenting these differences for a number of years and I think it's important that we say what we've been saying for another number of years that people start to divide in the education system long before they get to higher education. So if you do well in the education system there is no social economic gap now in terms of access to higher education and there's only a relatively small gap, social economic gap in terms of access to higher education. But that is not a very reassuring finding because what we do know is that the students from poor backgrounds fail to get to the point that they can actually access higher education. So for example, uh, the statement that there's no socioeconomic gap in access to HE um, is, is comparing two students with similar A-level grades. But in fact, poor students aren't getting the same A-level grades as their uh, richer counterparts. And what this means is that we can simultaneously claim that universities are meritocratic. They do let in the most qualified students based on A-levels and GCSEs. But at the same time, Steve is quite right, education has not improved social mobility. In fact, it may have worsened it. And what we're seeing is that the kids, um, by the time they even get to primary school, if they come from a poorer socioeconomic background, they're being left behind, behind to a, a far greater extent. Further, when we look at the research on what we might do about this, our research on schools suggests that many of the policy levers that we might want to pull such as interventions at school level, make far less difference than we might hope in terms of the child's achievement. The family background continues to dominate. So that's the evidence base, if you like. And what can we conclude from the rather dismal picture? First, although education is not a route to social mobility, uh, I think it's fair to say that... Um, even though the education system is not, entirely, uh, is not entirely meritocratic, it's certainly true that the wealthy are getting more on average from the education system. They have higher levels of outcomes. But it's also true that poorer children earn a higher return to a lot of the investments they make in education. So you have this conundrum where the, the poor child, where the counterfactual is in the even lower level of skill, is benefiting from the education, uh, even as we also acknowledge that the system is not working as we want it to work to push people through to high status jobs and, and get high stat status wages. But we can't ignore that aspect of it. Um, I think the second point is, I guess we could imagine a world where education, if you had enough will and enough investment, could be used to improve social mobility. We would need to disproportionately invest in the poor. And if you did that, some levelling might happen. The obvious place to start is we currently subsidise all um, people who put their, their children into childcare um, to varying degrees, but you could remove all subsidy for, for childcare, for higher earnings, for example. Uh, this would uh, you know, leave you with far more resource to invest in poor children. Not only that, but it might also, bizarrely, push some women out of the labour market. Uh, you would then equalise incomes at the same time. I don't see anybody really suggesting that as a policy solution. But um, again, what we also need to think about is if you did any of that, what would happen? And uh, my prediction would be that you would see the middle and upper classes continue to outstrip any investment the state could make to because they need to protect their children's route to this better job. So even if you did try and disproportionately invest in the way that I've just described, you would still have fight back from parents who would be trying to, to outstrip that investment. So I guess I come to my third point, which is the worse the jobs are in the middle and the bottom of the distribution, the more people will fight to make sure their kids don't fall down and make sure that they get on that top route. 
And I think we need to bear that in mind when we're thinking about policy. So just finally, in terms of what would we do about this situation, um, I feel very strongly that we can't give up on education because education enhances people's lives and skills, even if it doesn't produce better social mobility. It improves a whole lot of other outcomes. Um, and there's a danger that this can get lost in our disappointment that it's not a route for social mobility. Uh, when we go back to the issue of technology and technological change, if there's any hope of weathering such change, you need skills. So we need to continue to invest in the skills of all children, but particularly uh, poor children. And we have some ideas of how we might do that. Um, the other thing is you need to invest in human capital, not just because we want to invest in the human capital of the poorest, but because if we invest in the human capital of anyone, boys from Eton, if they improve productivity and GDP, long run it could benefit more because your economy would grow and get rid of the problem that uh, Steve has so eloquently outlined, which is we have real wages falling and we need to solve that. Um, and so finally, um, we need, it sounds obvious, to focus far more on labour market policy. Um, social mobility was greatest when there were more good jobs. Uh, we need to make jobs better. That means we need to go back and think about what's happening in the labour market. We need to protect the lower paid. We need to ensure adequate minimum wage, but also enforced minimum wage. We need to think, as we're doing, about compulsory training for workers. Uh, we need to think about the way the gig economy can be used as a way to avoid the very regulation that we want to bring in in terms of minimum wage. Because only when we've uh, narrowed the, the gap in experience between the top and the bottom will we, I think, a start to uh, impact on people's lives in such a way that people don't feel quite so frightened of their children, for example, falling down that social mobility ladder um, as they do at the moment. And, and that long term may be the best thing we can do to improve the situation even on the social mobility front. Thank you, Thank you Anna. I'm glad to say that the, the, the Sutton Trust, we're, we're, we're broadening our mission. Uh, and this was, this, ha this was decided before this panel happened, which was to improve social mobility through education and employment. So I'm, I'm sort of glad that we've done that here at UT. <laughs> One thing just to clarify, just before I hand over to John, Anna, on, on, on this. Are you saying that education doesn't help social mobility on average? So it is helping some individuals, it's just not all of them. Or you know, Can you just clarify whether you're saying is it an average thing that you're talking about? Um, or are you just saying it doesn't do that? I'm saying that the education is, system is not necessarily unmeritocratic. So we can't say that people are keeping poor kids out of elite universities because they want to keep them out. Uh, they're keeping them out because they haven't got the necessary level of educational achievement in the previous stage. Uh, and we say that at every stage. So we go back to the beginning of primary school and we find that poor kids have lower levels of skill. So on average, education is not proving to be the route out of social mobility, but of course within, to social mobility, but within that you will have, you know, it's an average, so you will have lots of students for whom it is the route out, it has to be the route out, because when you look at those top jobs, they're all occupied by people who have higher levels of education. So as a poor student, I need that. What I'm saying is on average, they don't get it. And they don't get it not because, you know, universities are keeping them out, but because skill gaps have emerged at age five and we need to, to work on that. But what I'm also agreeing with Steve on, which is even if we invest and, and do that, you've got this fight back of uh, richer parents protecting their children's roots. So right. just investing in education is not going to solve the social mobility problem. Okay, that's a good segue, because John's spoken a lot about those issues over the years. John, do you want to yeah, say your Yeah, thank bit? you. Well, uh, as usual, I partly agree and partly disagree with Steve. So. Uh, let me begin with the disagreements, which are mainly about evidence. First, I don't know what the evidence is that small class mobility has fallen over time. The paper Steve cites by Lorison and Friedman is very limited. It deals only with mobility into NSSEC class one, higher managerial and professional. And even then, I don't see that these authors in any way show that mobility falls because of occupational shifts within this class. Second, I also don't know what evidence there is that inequality has increased within big classes. Now, if the reference here is to earnings inequality, then the most detailed research that I know of, that by Mark Williams, shows that this is not in fact the case. Greater earnings inequality has been largely occupation and class-based. It reflects widening differences in average earnings between occupations, 
uh, rather than within occupations, and also the earnings polarization of the occupational and class structures. Third, yet again, I don't know what the evidence is that the supposed super elite, uh, distinguished by Mike Savage, has become very sticky. Uh, leave aside the facts that the data on which Savage draws are wildly unrepresentative. And leave aside the fact that entry into his super elite is largely dependent on one's house value. I am, in fact, myself a proud member of this super elite, although it often doesn't feel like it. Uh, leave all this aside. Savage has no overtime data at all. So how do we know whether this uh, super elite is increasing in its stickiness or not? Fourth, my own research has not shown that Britain is low in the international uh, league table uh, of social mobility. Uh, so far as absolute mobility is concerned, it indicates that Britain ranks fairly high and that so far as relative class mobility is concerned, that Britain is more or less mid-table. Uh, more importantly, though, a recent uh, working paper from the Institute of New Economic Thinking in Oxford um, essentially confirms uh, these findings and, in fact, emphasises that the supposed uh, cross-national variation in uh, especially relative mobility, is much narrower uh, than previously uh, supposed. It's cross-national commonality rather than cross-national variation that's striking. And the lead author of this paper, uh, Urshabet Bukodi, is here. So overall, then, I'm not so sure that the controversy between economists and sociologists is as easily resolved as Steve would argue. Uh, and anyway, it's quite fun. Um, <laughs> sociologists uh, would tend to the view that class mobility gives a much uh, fuller indication than does simply income or earnings mobility of the transmission of economic advantage and disadvantage across generations. And on this basis, the idea that mobility in Britain is in decline or that Britain is at the bottom of mobility league tables, these appear to be little more than politically useful myths. Now, the really disturbing uh, thing about mobility in Britain today is that while the total absolute rate is more or less constant, the downward component of this rate is increasing, while the upward component is decreasing. So this means that young people today have less favorable mobility <coughs> prospects than did their parents or their grandparents. Now, to where I agree with Steve, um, most importantly, I agree with him that it's rather strange to take social mobility in and of itself as an overriding policy goal, and that the focus of policy debate uh, should rather be on the various very different uh, drivers of social mobility. And in this connection, um, I would want to add that, at least from the standpoint of class mobility, the distinction between absolute and relative rates is quite crucial. If policy is to focus on absolute mobility, then presumably the aim is not just to increase the total rate, but to get back to the conditions that prevailed in what's become known as the golden age of social mobility from the 1950s through to the 1980s, when upward social mobility predominated over downward mobility. And so this then means initiating a new upgrading of the occupational and class structures, again creating rising levels of top-end jobs, creating more room at the top. And this, I would think, is 
essentially a matter where economic and especially industrial welfare and also fiscal policies uh, rather than educational policy uh, become quite central. And in fact, it's this that I would see as the most promising way ahead. If only because what's involved here is not a zero-sum game. Upward mobility can in this way be increased without also increasing downward mobility. However, if policy is to focus on relative rates of mobility, that is, on making them more equal, then this is a zero-sum game, even though politicians, including the one we heard this morning, are very reluctant to acknowledge this. In this case, any increase in upward mobility must have a corresponding increase in downward mobility. Simple mathematical fact. Now, education policy tends to be seen in this regard, making relative mobility rates more equal as uh, all important. But just because a zero-sum game is involved, I fear that resistance to egalitarian educational policies from those who've got most to lose by them will always represent a very serious barrier to progress. And this, at least, I believe, is what the historical record uh, very clearly shows. So on this point, again, I would agree with Steve. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, can I just clarify one thing with you then? Because I understand all the points about um, the differences and the different opinions you two have. But, but would, just to clarify, you would say that absolute mobility could be higher in this country, right? Or, or is, it, is it lower than it could be at the moment? Just to clarify, because when you look at some of your stats in your studies, yes. they are extreme differences between the professional and, and, and working class groups, right? So you, would you say that we could have higher mobility in absolute terms or relative terms? Yeah, by the total absolute mobility rate, I simply mean the proportion of people in the population who were found in a different uh, social class from that in which they originated. And if you work with the seven NSSEC classes, you find that way back to the Second World War, that total mobility rate has been at about 80%. About 80% of people in the population are found in a different uh, uh, NSSEC social class from their parents. Now, much of this mobility is very short range, but still, that's the total rate. And the crucial thing about it is that if you look at the period the second half of the uh, last century, you find you break that total mobility rate down into the upward component, the downward component. The upward component was steadily rising, the downward component was falling. From around the 1990s, that begins to change. And it's the downward component that's rising and the upward component that is falling. And that is entirely the result of changes in the occupational and class structure. Throughout this whole period, relative rates of mobility were essentially constant. Okay. Uh, Selina. The thing that I kept in mind as I was listening to Steve and reading his slides in advance is um, one of his most valuable findings to me, which is that uh, greater inequality leads to less upward social mobility, leads to less social mobility overall, but as has become clear from the previous speakers, to some extent what we're concerned with here is upward social mobility because that's what people seem to want. Um, nobody really wants to go down the social ladder. The other thing that I found very thought-provoking about what Steve said and the other contributions is this idea that we need to know more about the drivers of social mobility. I'm different to some of the other researchers here because my research is uh, predominantly about the past, but it's also predominantly qualitative in focus. So one of the things that I do is to undertake large numbers of interviews and to go out and find large uh, sets of data that record um, what people themselves believe constitutes social mobility, how they experience social mobility, and the impact of social mobility on their well-being. And I'd argue that those kinds of data sets are very uh, revealing, um, not only in terms of telling us more about whether people want social mobility or not, which is actually highly questionable, but also 
um, in terms of what they believe the drivers of social mobility to be. So they can't offer us a full and, and robust explanation of what drives social mobility, but I'd argue that they have a great deal to offer, given that, as Steve um, very eloquently pointed out, at the moment, much policy debate about the drivers of social mobility is based entirely on assumption, and very often assumptions about the past, and very often assumptions about that particular part of the past that John alluded to, which is the so-called golden age of social mobility between the 1950s and the 1970s. And that's the period that I just want to focus on uh, very briefly here. Because the way in which that period uh, is talked about is very often as one in which we see education as a driver for social mobility, specifically through the introduction of universal secondary education, according to a tripartite that quickly became a bipartite system, whereby 20% of so-called bright children went to academically selective grammar schools and the rest went to secondary moderns. One of the things that my research shows, um, and which is borne out by other more quantitative studies, is that that form of education had no benefits whatsoever in terms of increasing upward social mobility. It's the case that even the small minority of children who went to grammar schools from working class backgrounds tended to leave disproportionately early, that is to say at the earliest possible age that they could leave school with very few qualifications. And yet, as John points out, this is a period where we do see high rates of upward social mobility. Why is that? Well, I think as John's research shows, it's to do with the expansion of room at the top in terms of the labour market. And it's also, as Steve points out, to do with a rise in income, the way in which those particular jobs are valued. Now, that leads me on to another point, which I think is implicit in much of what Steve said and also what John said, which is that there are subjective ways in which social mobility is defined. And we've heard a lot about a debate today between economists and, so and sociologists in defining it. But in terms of who defines social class, we have to look at the top of our society, at the political class and their friends in business and industry. Who defines a profession was a question that was on the policy table in post-war Britain. Who sets wages, who negotiates over how a job is valued, who determines what accreditation is needed for such a job, and who determines what group is defined as professional? These are highly pertinent and political questions for our times. As we see, and as Steve reminds us, we're in a period in which the labour market is changing rapidly, and, is up, and it is up to the political class to start defining which jobs we value most and to explain why and to justify those decisions. What I'm arguing, really, is that we need a society in which we begin to revalue uh, certain jobs and revalue what we, and re redefine what we mean by the social ladder, rather than unquestioningly assuming that what we should be about is getting a few people into the so-called top jobs. We need to determine what those top jobs are, and we should make policymakers realise that that is something which is not an absolute, it's not fixed through time, it's something that they can redefine and that they should do. There was no policy in post-war Britain to open up top management or the existing professions, and so they didn't open up. What happened in post-war Britain is that certain jobs, such as nursing, for example, became redefined as professions, largely in the public sector and in the service sector. Um, those jobs expanded, and children from lower down the social ladder were able to move up and fill those new opportunities. My research goes back into, further into the 20th century and the 19th century, and this is what you see time and time again. If you want movement to the top, you expand at the top, right? And it goes back to what Anna said, which is that those who are already at the top are a vested interest group, and they, are not, they have no vested interest in opening up their opportunities to other people's children. They will appoint their own or children who look like them. The job, therefore, now, to some extent, is for us to ask whether we try to create more room at the top, as was done in the post-war period, and or whether we find ways of tackling those at the top in some of the older professions in order to make those professions open up in new ways. What's really interesting um, about what Anna and also Steve said is this issue of educational expansion um, and what it leads to. 
I'd argue that educational expansion has had real benefits um, historically, um, but it is about when it expands comprehensively and non-selectively that we see it having those real benefits. And just two examples, the massive expansion of further education, not higher education, but further education in the late 60s and 70s, directly benefited adults, particularly adult women, returning to learn and then being retrained and upskilled for the economy. So we have a situation where adult, where adult women were real beneficiaries at that point. And in fact, they make up a huge proportion, something like a third to a half, depending on which year you look at, of FE participants throughout the 1970s. The other big uptake in terms of education is working class kids going into higher education, which begins to happen in the 1990s. What's happened there is not any kind of upsurge in selection um, in, in secondary education. It's about the fact that by then we've had a decade of full comprehensive education in England and Wales um, and comprehensive sixth forms as well, plus an expansion at higher education level. But as Steve suggests, that doesn't necessarily lead to higher rates of upward social mobility over time. We also need to think, um, I believe, about who gets the opportunities when opportunities are, ma are made available. And again, lots of assumptions are made here about aspirational parents, particularly ambitious children, and how we inculcate people at the bottom with the desire to want to be at the top. But in fact, my research and other qualitative data demonstrates that most parents, most of the time, are highly ambitious for their children, highly aspirational, want their children to do better from them. So although we can't measure that, I think we can fairly conclusively say that the problem is not at the bottom. That said, whether people want social mobility is really a moot point. Um, I've recently been working with a massive data set that we've just put together um, based on responses of volunteers in 2014 to 2017. And most people don't want social mobility. What they want for themselves is economic security. And what they want for their children is greater control over their lives, which they see as offered by often entering a profession. In the post-war period, it was entering a trade very often because a trade gave you skills you could take with you. So I think that that's something we need to respond to. We're aware that we're in a volatile political climate. And rather than problematizing people at the so-called bottom, maybe we should try listening to them. Just finally, the other thing that we need to think about in, in relation to uh, change and policy drivers, and this goes back to something that Steve mentioned and also John, um, is what we do about people at the top. Now, I mentioned that one of the things that we need to think about is how we might open up some of those older professions. But the other is how we get rid of some of these vested interests, which actually do create elite, for example, elite, elite um, educational institutions. And just to end on that point about education, I'm not sure that education ever can be a driver for social mobility, but I would like to see us think about equality within education. And just to finally, just to end, I'd just suggest that one of the very easy ways of doing that for government would be to end the lobbying power of the Russell Group and actually say they're no longer a particularly um, prized lobbying group. We're going to listen to all universities equally. Thank you, Selena. Right, OK. Steve, I'm, I'm going to give you two minutes to respond then, because... OK, now, there's rather a lot uh, that was yeah. said there, and it's, uh, most of it's very, very impressive, I think, uh, including a bunch of things I've not even th thought about, which is, re which is really good. Um, so let's, let's, um, let's, go, uh, let's go in reverse order. Let's go for Selena first. So I thought there was a couple of really, really good points. So the point about do people actually want social mobility is, of course, really um, interesting and fundamental, I think. And if it really is economic security and more economic, in, more economic equality, then that's actually much more deliverable in some ways because you can deliver that through uh, certainly interventions on the labour market much more than you can perhaps through the long-run supply-side reforms that you might think about potentially affecting things through education. Um, I also thought it was particularly interesting the, the point about education expansion, uh, because right at the end of my talk, I, I, I spoke very, very briefly about the idea about vocational education and further education uh, being important to try and get people to compete in the labour market, perhaps, with, with better quality uh, vocational qualifications 
perhaps competing with people with lower level degrees to actually perhaps bring down wage differentials between graduates and non-graduates, which of course would reduce inequality. And so it's particularly interesting actually, I, thought that I hadn't really thought of it as, and in terms of the success stories of the 60s and 70s, and I think actually that's, that is true, and that should actually be brought into the public debate about these things. So when, when I said before about, oh, that old chest and it's never worked, I was kind of referring to things about what's happened to vocational education from, I guess, the 80s onwards. Uh, when it's always been underfunded and never and never actually delivered properly, um, so I think actually harking back to the success stories from then uh, is actually an important thing for policy, a real big, really big important thing. Okay, again, the other thing, the other thing in, in, in there's, this, there's this literature a little bit about about anxious climbers as well, uh, which kind of goes back to this thing about do people want social mobility? So there's some people who you know do come from a working class background perhaps and and, and end up in a in a setting where they uh, don't really want to be. Uh, or you know, and, and stuff as well. We've, and so sort of issues to do with that, I think, are kind of interesting. Um, final one. Final one. I was going to go to John next. Okay, let me. Let me let, okay, John. So, so let me do it really fast on John. Um, so, um, the first stuff about what we do and we don't agree on is much like many academic debates about how you might interpret different pieces of pieces of research and how you link them into the, into the kind of discussions. I think it's much more. Uh, productive to think about what we, uh, we what, what we kind of on the same wavelength exactly. I, I think they're actually my, relatively minor differences in terms of the big picture. Anyway, I think the observation about the golden age and the upgrading in the room at the top is really important. And I should have mentioned some discussion. It, it is healthy that actually there's discussions about industrial strategy that are now taking place in, in, in government. Whether it's a real industrial strategy that will take place or not, I don't know. But critical aspects of that, I think, are about the adult workforce and investing in human capital and reskilling. So we have this real big asymmetry in terms of the way that government de deals with firms and offers them tax credits on what they do. So there's loads of tax credits out there for investment in physical capital. So R&D tax credits, if you kind of go and do some risky stuff and it doesn't pay off, you get money back from government because you kind of get bailed out. There's nothing like that on the human capital side about workers, um, for example. There is in other countries, Austria. When people get laid off in Austria, there's a very good system, perhaps hollowed out by technical change, where people automatically get retraining and they don't tend to move down to a lower grade occupation once they're, if you like, hollowed out by technical change. They may well move up. Uh, whereas, whereas in Britain and America, we don't see many people moving up um, when they get displaced because of automation and technology. And that's in part, I think, because actually there is a proper system which actually offers employers tax credits on human capital as well as in the way of physical capital. We have none of that. And I'm amazed it's never been on the debate, a, a policy debate. Companies are sitting on huge profit piles at the moment. Um, and they're not investing in physical capital or human capital. I, I acknowledge there's an uncertain situation, which was magnified by the Brexit vote and so on. But, um, but you know, but they are sitting on huge profit files. Actually, cash holdings are really high right. in, in FTSE okay. 500 companies. Now, one last thing, Ben and Anna. It has to be 10 okay. seconds. Okay, I agree with practically everything Anna said. If people like, if, if, on most things. If people, like, if, if people like that kind of stuff about taking over things by the privilege, there's Richard Reeves' good book, which has come yeah, out on, on, on opportunity hoarding, mm. where he says, don't just focus on the top 1% in America, focus on the top 20%, the upper middle class in America who are basically taking over anything that the government in invests in. At Surestart was a good example here, actually, but Surestart basically got taken over by the middle classes in the places where it worked and then it was dumped in, in, the, in places where it didn't work. Right, I'm going to have to stop you there because you've all done enough to uh, <laughs> criticise education in all its forms here. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, and it's really interesting, I'm going to open it to John, that you spent, I think, of your six minutes, I think, five minutes and 30 seconds on the disagreement with Steve, <laughs> and then the last 30 seconds on the things you agreed with. But anyway, I just thought it was interesting. So I just wanted to show our appreciation for some brilliant, excellent... <laughs>